now. All right, everyone, welcome to Disasters and Museum Preparedness Hurricane Edition. If you're not aware of us or what we do, my name is Tristan Herrenstein, uh, this is Mike Toman. We both work for the Florida Public Archaeology Network and our mission, we are a statewide program. Our mission is to promote the value of his history and archaeology and the preservation of them. And that by extension is what we're doing here today is we are working with local museums to help them preserve and uh, preserve our, our history. So this is a kind of a cut down special edition version of our typical disaster museum preparedness workshop. If you want that, uh, when we're back and able to meet in person again, we can come and do this program with you. Basically it gets you started on developing a disaster plan. Uh, it has you actually come away with some paperwork and ready, everything ever already started. Um, so that is about a two hour workshop. We are, we've cut this down to, I'm gonna talk about 30 minutes here. And then Mike has got about 50 minutes. He's gonna talk about what they do at the, uh, the Station Archaeology Museum in Pensacola, their plan and how they prepare for hurricanes. And then we'll have time for some questions and discussion right at the end. So without further ado, um, I want to take a moment and talk about why we're talking about this. Of course, you know, Hurricane Michael is in forefront of all of our minds. It's the one that's most affected us and most dramatically affected us. So this is kind of in our minds and what we're specifically focusing on today. And, you know, it's hurricane season. It's a good time to talk about this, good time to prepare for these. But I want to make it a point to highlight the fact that there are a lot of more mundane emergencies that we can run into which can affect us at really any time of our, um, any time with our museums, anything from broken water pipes, leaky roofs, fire, fungus, pests, and even burglary. So these can hit us any time and having a plan in place can help reduce or even completely eliminate some of these. And what we're talking about today definitely covers these issues. Um, the, the things I'm suggesting doing now to prepare for hurricanes will also help you out with these situations, although I have cut some things out that would apply to some of the situations that don't apply specifically to hurricanes. So there is not, this is definitely not the full two hour workshop, um, but there is information here that applies to lots of things. So keep, we're talking about hurricanes, but keep these other things in mind too as we go forward, because these can be just as bad as a hurricane for your museum. So when we talk about preparing for an emergency, uh, there's three different phases to an emergency. There's before the emergency, emergencies happening right now, what do we do? And then after the emergency, so basically how do we get back to normal operating procedures? So for the damp workshop and for this specifically, we are very much focusing on the before the emergency section. Um, we are looking at this because uh, um, the during the emergency and after the emergency sections both take a lot of planning to actually have a lot of effect and really some of the stuff we're talking about in preparing for an emergency is necessary groundwork for the later effects. So right now we focus exclusively on the planning things um, also, some of the stuff we're talking about is relatively simple things we can do now that has bigger effects even in those later phases. So that's why we focus on this now. If there is ever the interest, we definitely can look at expanding the damp workshop to include uh, the other two stages as well. Um, so that this is what we're focusing on today when it comes to hurricanes. So one of the first things you can do and the biggest impact of really pretty much any disaster is to develop an emergency response team. And so these are people um, who have basically have assigned leadership roles in the event of emergency. And this is really important to establish now rather than later because um, you don't need, in the middle of emergency when there's a lot of stress and maybe some people panicking and um, all kinds of water everywhere or, what, or whatever's going on. 
you don't need confusion about who is in charge, who people should turn to for answers or for instructions, okay? So now is the time to get this kind of thing figured out. This will help save you a lot of problems down the road. So your emergency response team ideally will consist of four people. Now I say that fully understanding that for a lot of our smaller local museums, that is potentially a very tall ask. Um, so I know that is hard, maybe hard to pull off, but if you can do it, get four people. If you can't do it, do the best you can. But we want four people for a few reasons. One is, this is just too much to fall on one person's head. This is too much for one person to try and figure out um, to deal with all in one go. So it's better to try and spread around that responsibility so it's not entirely reliant on one person. Also, if it does reply entirely on one person, what happens if that person can't make it? If their own house is severely damaged in the hurricane and they cannot come and deal with the museum right now, then who is in charge? So that's why you want to try and have multiple people to have some of that redundancy in that situation. So this consists of a response lead, so the person who's overall in charge of the recovery efforts, collections lead, and then two alternates. And the alternates are there basically to take on either role if the, the uh, response leader collections lead cannot make it. But also they're there um, if you know you do have both leads, then they can actually take on some of the responsibilities and kind of help ease that even further because it still is quite a lot of responsibility even the way it's broken down. So shoot for four if you can. If you can't, do the best you can, but uh, try and get at least that. So what does, does each role do? Um, the response lead, uh, the most important and critical thing that they would be responsible for is safety. And I say this in all earnesty because your safety is your top priority over your collections, over your building, everything. The safety of you and your volunteers needs to be your top priority. So uh, keep that in mind. And this is, again, why it's so important we have someone who is prepared to take on this role now rather than in the moment. Because in the moment, uh, it's likely this kind of thing could be forgotten. And you want someone who has this on their mind that they need to keep, make sure people are being safe. That includes, uh, is the building safe to go into? Um, are there hazards people need to be aware of? Are they wearing the, the correct protective equipment? Um, all the way down to, are people drinking water? Is somebody looking hot? Do they need to take a break? These things are things that should be on our top priority. So this is why we want someone who has this in their mind. Other response lead roles, um, these are just kind of suggestions. You can change this up or whatever you see fit. Um, coordinating with responders. So if you have the fire department out or if you need to make sure the building is safe, you get into them first. Response lead will be the one to work with. Uh, responders to whatever situation you're dealing with. Keeping in touch with the community and stakeholders can be very important. Um, you don't want rumors getting started like the museum was hit hard and they're throwing away all this heritage. Get out there and grab it while you can. So if you can, a few announcements on social media, maybe through uh, whatever you think is appropriate in your communities, can really help to kind of uh, nip those in the bud and kind of keep people informed as to what's going on. It can also get you uh, potentially extra volunteers if you really need it or extra supplies. So that's something that is good to keep in mind. Securing the site. So basically keeping people off site who shouldn't be there. That's for their safety. That's for the safety of your volunteers, safety of your collection. So essentially making sure that that is uh, uh, people who are not supposed to be there are kept out getting the building back to operating situation. Um, assembling equipment and supplies. I'm gonna talk a little bit about doing this beforehand. This is mostly talking about in the moment. You know, if it turns out you don't have this supply and you really need it, or you didn't have enough of something, you need to get some more, then they're in charge of, you know, at least delegating to someone, go get to the store, get these supplies, that kind of thing. Managing resources, this is mostly referencing uh, your budget. So you may not have the budget for everything. Um, and so having someone who's aware of what the budget is like and what is uh, feasible for you, then this is good as well. And the last thing, and really after safety, this is the most important thing, is documenting the incident and the damage. 
And this has a lot of reasons this is important. If you have insurance, this is critical for insurance. If you want FEMA support, this could help you out down that road as well. This could help get you volunteers if you need it. Um, this can help you keep track of what happens to things. There are documented cases where museum floods, people pull everything out, but there's no place to store them. So volunteers take things home to take care of them and some stuff is never seen again. So writing down what happens to things, where they're going, that is absolutely critical in this moment. That even happens with professional, um, like freezers take things and some things never get back to folks. So keep this thing documented. And this is again why it's so important to have someone uh, responsible or assigned to these roles. Because when you're stressed out, when you're trying to react quickly, when you're worried about those things that are sitting in water right now, who's going to think about needing to document things and write things down and stopping and taking some pictures before things get moved. You, get, you want to have someone who's willing and able to think of that kind of thing. So that's again why this sort of thing is so important. So for collections leads, their role again, safety first. Okay, again, that is the most important thing we can be conscious of when we are dealing with these situations. They're there to limit the damage. So if, uh, you know, the roof is still leaking, trying to get that stopped or getting things out of the way of the water, um, saving your collection. So getting them out of the building, getting them cared for in a way that will hopefully save them so that you can put them back in with li limited or no damage. Um, they are also the ones who are going to be organizing recovery efforts. So organizing the volunteers, um, directing people where to go, what to grab, how to take care of things, and where things are going to go for recovery. And again, documenting the incident and the damage. And this is just a really important step that uh, we need to try and keep in mind is easy to forget in the midst of things. Okay, and then of course you have these two roles and then you have your alternates who can also take on some, some or all of these responsibilities depending on your situation. So who should be on your emergency response team? Well, um, that can be your staff, your board members, and your volunteers kind of in that order of preference, but you know, do what you have, whatever you need to do. If your staff person lives 30 miles away and you have some very dedicated volunteers that live right next door, then maybe they should be kind of um, your emergency response person, or they should at least be one of your alternates maybe. Uh, you kind of do what you need with this. That's just kind of some guidelines to kind of get you started. Okay, so having that emergency response team, having it decided who will be in charge when something goes wrong is a big step towards preventing problems in the middle of an emergency. So this is a good thing to, to figure out now rather than later. Another thing you can do is get a floor plan set up. Okay, this is not too hard to do, but it can have pretty good effects. So if you have a formal floor plan for your building, great, make a photocopy of it, and then use that. If you don't have that, you can make your own sketch. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, done in AutoCAD or anything. It doesn't have to be perfectly accurate, just so long as it's easily readable and you can use it when you need it. So when you have your floor plan, name all of your rooms and quadrants. Um, so if you have just a big room, you might want to break it up into sections so you can better communicate where things are at to people. Um, so have everything named. And essentially the way this can work is you know, you're, you're telling people go to such and such room, get uh, such and such items so that they know to go to room B and it's, you can even label it right on the door frame, room B, they know exactly where to go. You don't want people stumbling around in places that may not be safe and in places that are just gonna add to confusion or potentially damage things or hurt people. So uh, this is a, a good step to have place early on. While you're doing this, make sure to mark your entrances and exits, locations of your fire extinguishers, and your utility shutoff. So wire, electrical, and gas lines. And so once you have all this set up, this is a great thing to have up hanging in your office so that if anyone ever needs it or your volunteers need to check it and you're not there, that they can actually look at this and see where the water shot up, if, if there's a broken pipe or anything down the road. Okay, so this is great to have. When you finish this, it's even worth checking with your fire department and see if they will would like it as well, because having this information could be useful to them down the road. 
It's also, and I'll talk about this later, it's also good to have a relationship with your emergency personnel built up so they understand what your needs are. So a floor plan, not too hard to do, but this can have pretty big impacts in the event of emergency. So it, again, it's about things you can do now that can help prevent problems later. Another thing you can do is prioritize your collection. And this is probably one of the harder things to do just because of there's maybe a lot of discussion that might need to go around this. Um, because you know you may think, oh, such and such thing, that is our most important thing. But do, does your board agree? Do your volunteers agree? This is the time to sit down with everybody and go over what is top priority, okay? And this can even have uh, conversations about how do we take care of things. So speaking of the, thinking of the Carabelle Museum, who we've done some of this stuff with already, they sat down with everybody and there was not agreement on what was most important. And there was even some good conversation that came out of this, like someone said, well, this case of uh, pot sherds that are labeled with the site location is the most important thing. If we're, there's an emergency, that's what I would grab. And then they said, okay, but how would you do that? If you just shovel everything in a bucket, now you don't have locations for them anymore. What is the point of saving them then? Um, so these kind of thing can lead to some good conversations now that can help you out down the road. So when you're prioritizing your collection, make a short list of no more than 20 of your most important items. Now, 20 is probably pushing it maybe even. So if you get 10 to 15 and you're happy with that, that's good. Uh, you, shorter is probably fine. So don't feel like you have to hit 20. While you're working on this list, and this, is, this part is in no particular order, consider what is irreplaceable, what is expensive to replace, what is locally important. Don't forget your documents and records while you're making this list. And also don't forget to include any documentation that goes with your important objects. So if you have a diary that goes with a specific object, those things are less without the other. So make sure that it's recorded that they go together and they, they, they are both important and need to be tried and saved, kept together. Um, and so once you have your list, then what you do is uh, write everything out on index cards and you rearrange them on a table until you have your most to least important objects and you have consensus. Okay, again, this is the time to develop that consensus. You don't want people arguing or feeling like their favorite thing is being ignored um, in, the emer in the case of emergency. That's not extra stress that you need at that time. So again, having this done now will help you out down the road. Um, Another thing you can start to do now is to assemble a disaster bin. And so these are essentially supplies that you will probably need in the event of a disaster. Um, this is a container of some sort. I've seen it generally recommended, one of those large really garbage bins. And those are pretty good because they're easy to move around and they're also a good size for you to hold your supplies. Um, decide on a location where you're gonna keep it. Mark that location on your floor plan and then make sure you clearly label it because you don't want people thinking it's a garbage can throwing their banana peels and apple cores in there. Um, and you also don't want people thinking it's just a general supply thing. So make sure it's labeled uh, emergency only or you know, a disaster bin or whatever the case may be. Um, now, as far as what should go in here, I'm gonna come out of this really quickly. So this is a folder I have up on Google Drive, which I will go ahead and share that now. Um, I'll put a link in it for now, in the chat now, and then I'll send around an email afterwards to everyone so you have that as well. Um, so this file is for the full workshop. So there's a lot of things in here that we aren't covering. You can feel free to look through this as you like. You see right here, we have a copy of the presentation I'm giving you right now. So that is available um, to, for you to look at or check out those links however you need. What I wanna look at right now particularly is the disaster bin right here. And you can see I've got a list of supplies that can go in your disaster bin with suggested amounts for you to consider 
you, of course, decide what is most relevant to you. Now, again, depending on budget restraints and everything, you may think, oh gosh, this is a lot of stuff. How are we going to afford this? You don't have to do this all in one go, okay? Um, go through this list, figure out maybe what is easiest, maybe what is top priority, and start working on it, start collecting it, but you don't have to have it all done right now. Um, but it's better to have some of this rather than none of this. So get started on it and then be ready to think outside the box. Ask for donations. If you're holding a talk or maybe a movie night or something, have the, uh, the prize of admission be a roll of paper towels or, or whatever. So really you can figure this, you can do this, okay? Um, and this is all good stuff for you to have on hand for just about any disaster. <clears throat> Similar to the disaster bin, there's also a disaster store. Now you look at this and again, if depending on your budget, you think, oh gosh, this is even more expensive stuff. How are we gonna manage this? Again, you don't have to have all of this now. You don't even have to have all of this yourself. I'll talk about in a little bit some ways you might get access to these things in emergency that you don't, um, that you, so you can have them, but you don't have to buy them yourself. Um, so don't stress about this. This is just for your reference so you can get an idea of what might be a good idea and, and try to make those calls for yourself, okay? And that these are all in the file that I have linked and will send again as a follow-up email as well. Okay, so back to our talk. Okay, disaster bin, that's all set. So another thing to keep in mind are the support networks. Um, and by support networks, I'm talking about assembling your volunteers, uh, looking and tapping into external expertise, and finally looking for partnerships re with related institutions. And I'll talk about that uh, in a little more detail here. So when it comes to assembling your volunteers, you may know everybody who uh, is volunteering and who you can count on in an event of an emergency. But can you think of everybody in the middle of an emergency when you're stressed out and trying to rush things and, and all that? Um, can you think of everybody's phone number right then and there? So now is a good time to start getting that together. Get a, start a list, get everyone's name down and their contact information on that, in, on that. If you want, you could even include things like how far away they live. That can be valuable information. That's up to you. Other things to get on here are any relevant skills they may have. So if you have a plumber who's a volunteer and they're willing to donate their, their skills in an emergency or a roofer, great. Get that written down there so you know who you can, you can ask to help out when you need it. Also, like I said earlier, you don't need to have all the equipment yourself. Figure out who is willing to lend their equipment to you when, when it's emergency. Um, does somebody have a dehumidifier? Do they have a wet vac or a, a generator that they will, are willing to loan the museum? So uh, get that written down too. That is a good way of getting some of that equipment that you don't need to store or have on hand all the time, but when you need it, you can still get access to it. <clears throat> okay, also for support networks, uh, looking to your external expertise. You don't have to do all this yourself. This is not things you need to know how to handle all yourself right now. So there are people out there who want to help you. First and foremost is going to be your emergency personnel. Um, they are probably one of your best resources for what you can do now. They can help you out as far as maybe pointing out any weaknesses or hazards in your museum, um, a tree that needs to come down or whatever the case may be. Also, it's a really good idea to have a working relationship with the emergency personnel. They, you're, you have different needs than a, an average re private residence or business. You have delicate things in your museum. And if they understand that and understand what your needs are, you're potentially going to have um, better response from them, they're gonna be able to hand, help you out better than they would otherwise. Example is, um, I can't remember the name of the museum right now, but there's a World War II museum in Carabelle. And they have 
two entrances to their building, and the most like, logical one is right through their archives. And um, they are concerned, and rightly so, that if there is a fire, fire department is going to go right through their archives with all that water. When it, if they could go around, it would be better. So that is, you know, example of why it's good to have a uh, relationship with your emergency personnel, so that they can help you out and they understand what your needs are, even in the event of emergency. Another thing, good thing to set up now is contractors, partly because you want them to have an understanding of what your needs are as well, but also um, they know you, you have an agreement set up, maybe even pricing set up. Um, this can potentially help you get quicker response even in emergency. So get the contractor arrangement set up now, get their contact information written down. Um, for all of this, uh, and I'll, I guess I'll reference this a little bit later, but make sure you have duplicates of this information. If all this is sitting on in your office and it floods and now it's all a sodden mess on the floor, where are you going to get that information? So make sure you have this, this information spread around to multiple sources. Um, now I know that insurance is asking an awful lot of a lot of our small museums. If you can get insurance, please, please, please get insurance because that is going to help you out a lot. If you have had FEMA help after an emergency before, they're going to expect you to have insurance before they can help you again. And that's just part of the deal of them working with public money. They understand that it's, a, it's hard for some people to manage, but that's the restrictions they're working under. Um, but also your insurance agent themselves they are a resource. Again, make sure they understand your needs. They can give you advice on best practices, how to move forward, that kind of thing. So your insurance agent is a good resource for you. And uh, last one, this is someone you can call directly, not so much in the preparation phase, but if you have something go wrong and you need help or advice on how to deal with um, a wedding dress that got wet, how do, you, how do we try to save it, that kind of thing. National Heritage Responders is a hotline that you can call anytime 24 seven and they are here specifically to help advise you on emergency procedures and how to deal with these situations. So they are there, they are a great resource. I highly recommend getting this one pinned up uh, so you can find it when you need it. Okay, um, also now we're on the support networks. Sorry, the last for support networks are looking for partnerships related institutions. So basically, look for other museums or archives or maybe even libraries that you can relate, get a relationship with. You want ones that are working on their own disaster plans as well, because if you come to agreements to share supplies or volunteers, you wanna make sure that this partnership is equivalent. You don't wanna just be um, their crutch, essentially. You want to make sure that you can help each other. Um, that's with supplies, but even with if you agree to share volunteers, you want to make sure you're sending volunteers into a situation that is, first of all, safe, that they're, they are being safe at this location, but also that your volunteers are not just there, more people causing more chaos, that they know how to use them. So when you're looking for these partnerships, make sure that they are um, doing at least a similar level of preparation to what you're doing. Now, when it comes to being able to do our full workshop again, if you have someone you want to partnership with and you want to do a joint workshop together, that would be fantastic. We, are, we would be thrilled to do that. Um, just let us know, uh, of course, when that will be. We have no idea, um, but uh, we're ready to do it again once we can. Okay, just a few other tips. This is kind of like there is an impending hurricane, what do we do kind of information. This is from Southeast Museums Conference. Update your photos of inside and outside. So make sure you have updated photos of what things are like before the disaster strikes. Backup any electronic records. If you have everything stored on a hard drive inside your museum, get that duplicated. Get it in a cloud, get it on hard drives in other people's places, do both. Really, again, the more you can spread that around, the more likely it is to survive uh, an emergency. Secure things that can blow around. Of course, we think of like chairs outside, but that also applies to inside. You know, if a window breaks and wind starts blowing through your museum, what's going to happen to that stack of historic documents sitting on the desk? 
So make sure you have everything secure so it doesn't blow around uh, unnecessarily because I mean, some of it may happen anyway, but you want to do what you can to stop that from happening. Um, get things up off the floor. If you have thing, valuable artifacts sitting on the floor, get them raised up. Um, and that can save you a lot of problems, a lot of complication if there is any flooding. And uh, probably we know this one pretty well, but get everything covered with plastic sheets, your displays, your electronics, your, your um, archives, your papers, every, everything you can manage, get them covered with plastic sheets. Uh, if they do still get wet, at least they won't get wet directly that way, or at least hopefully. Uh, and that can save you a lot of problems as well. Okay, and just to wrap up some resources for you, and if you want to do any further looking or resources I relied on to put some of this together. Of course, there's National Heritage Responders again. They're, they're a very good resource. I recommend them. <clears throat> Two documents that are uh, books or whatever that you can look at that I looked at a lot for putting this all together. Um, be prepared and help. Um, be prepared is a free online PDF that you can get access to. If you just put in a search for that title, it will come up. Um, I, it is excellent until it's terrible. So um, take it with a big grain of salt. Um, when it comes to how do you organize, how do you prepare, it has some great advice and some, at least some good things to get you thinking about. But when it has at least fallen flat in such a big way that may prevents me from recommending this wholeheartedly is in particular one case where when they, preparing for disaster uh, procedures. They say for, I think it was either a hurricane or a typhoon, open the windows to equalize the pressure with the inside and the outside, which I hope we all know is really kind of just dangerous nonsense. So don't rely on them for that. I highly recommend looking at other sources for that kind of thing. When it comes to organizing things and putting a plan together though, it is pretty darn good. Um, help is extremely thorough to a fault. It is, um, uh, it is something you do, you would have to pay for it. It's about $70. Um, and it is written for with the biggest possible museum in mind, thinking that you can just scale it down to whatever size museum you're working with, which I suppose, I suppose works up to a point, but the difference between the Smithsonian museums and our little one room local museums is so different that even though I was looking through this just and not putting together a plan, I was discouraged by everything they said needed to be done. And while, yeah, a lot of that would be nice, it does not your most important things. It's not the most critical things that happen. So it's, it, I will tell you, no, don't do it. It may be valuable for some people, but for most by and large, I would suggest that that $70 is bent, better spent on supplies for your disaster bin than by buying this. Actually, a lot of the forms that I have available in that folder I've uh, linked you and shown you are based off of forms that they um, have in this manual as well. So there is a, they, it is a good resource but just with some caveats. <clears throat> there is also the uh, Heritage Emergency and Response Training, or HART. They offer a training in DC that you can apply for. They, I, I have to look this up to be sure, but I think they pay for your room and board and you have to pay for your travel. Um, so there are limited spaces. I tried to get in last go around and I, I wasn't in, but I will try this again. But if that's something that interests you, Keep an eye on them and apply for it when it comes up um, again. Also, uh, obviously, uh, Smithsonian is a great resource. Obviously, it's built for large museums, but it's also free. So, you know, that's a little more valuable there. Um, Zoom will let me actually click on it. Um, yeah, that'll work. Um, so, they have a lot of good resources available to you. Um, on emergency preparedness, how to deal with specific uh, problems. Uh, if you have certain things get wet, how do you deal with that? So a lot of fantastic resources, highly recommend that. Also, um, ready.gov has a whole section on developing emergency response plans. 
Neither of these are hurricane specific, but like I said, a lot of what these plans cover will apply to hurricanes and practically any other disaster out there as well. So there's a lot of great resources in both of those. And that is about all I have. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Mike now, and he'll let us uh, talk to us about what kinds of planning they have set up for the uh, Destination Archaeology Museum in Pensacola and how they prepare for disaster there. Yeah, great. Can everybody hear me okay? I'll assume that you good. Okay, I got a thumbs up. Well, I think all right, that's so all. Headphones. Yeah, that, yeah, I think that's all like really great information, a lot of wonderful resources. So uh, I really and highly encourage everybody to go check that out. And so uh, basically, Tristan just asked me to kind of talk about what we do in our circumstance um, with our facilities uh, at the uh, FPAN headquarters in downtown Pensacola. And I realized that, you know, we're probably all uh, dealing with a lot of different issues, uh, and that's all going to really vary. Um, with a wide spe spectrum, depending on, you know, if you're a nonprofit organization that's running a museum or if you're city owned or county owned or state owned or with us, we're with the university. So there's a lot of different layers uh, that um, go into play with any, any emergency that comes up that you have to respond to if, if you have a collection. And so our, our situation is a little unique, um, but I just wanted to talk about how how we kind of put some of this into actual practice um, uh, based on a lot of what Tristan said. And so the, like I said, so just to kind of give a little bit of background. So our, our building uh, the, at the Florida Public Archaeology Network uh, Coordinating Center or headquarters is located in downtown Pensacola or uh, right on Pensacola Bay. We're actually located by a city park, probably about a hundred meters from the water. Um, and so we are, we are um, a statewide program of the University of West Florida. So we have offices located throughout the entire state. But our coordinating center is a lot, it's very unique from the rest of our centers in the sense that, number one, our building is actually a historic building. So our building was constructed in 1903. So the building itself is historically significant. It's actually a very large building, so we're on the uh, what was at one time uh, the LNN uh, Marine Terminal uh, for a railroad for the LNN uh, Railroad Company, and so it's a very large, fairly large building. So we actually have um, two floors. We have a bottom floor where we have our museum uh, that uh, has a, has a number of different artifacts on display that are locked in cases. We also have on the same bottom floor um, a couple restrooms, a hallway, and then across the hallway we have an archeology span lab. And this is where we allow volunteers to come in uh, once a week, you know, un under normal circumstances, you know, not during COVID, but normally we, we allow people to come in. And they help us sort artifacts that have been recovered by the University of West Florida from different projects over the years. And all those collections are usually owned by the state, the state of Florida. So we have a lot of collections in there that are constantly changing uh, that we have to obviously be concerned about. And then upstairs um, on, on our top level, on our second floor, we have uh, basically offices and a classroom with a lot of different types of electronic equipment, office equipment, printers, computers, stuff like that upstairs. Um, so that's kind of the layout of our building. And so uh, the reason why I mentioned our proximity to the water is because uh, during Hurricane Ivan, so before we had actually moved into this building, uh, in 2004, a Hurricane Ivan, uh, there was a storm surge that brought about six feet of water into the lower level of the building. Uh, and actually, we had that marked on post where that water level was at. So um, we are susceptible to storm surge. We are susceptible to, susceptible to that flooding that can come onto our bottom floor. So that's something that we're obviously really concerned about when it comes to uh, collections in particular, but really anything else that we have in the building that can get affected by that. Uh, we also have a number of vehicles, state vehicles, that we're responsible for maintaining in our parking lot. Um, and so those are another thing that we have to kind of be concerned about whenever there is uh, the threat of a hurricane uh, during hurricane season. And so um, our building, uh, even though we are, it's the FPIN headquarters, the building is actually owned and maintained by the University of West Florida's uh, UWF Historic Trust. So they're the ones that actually own and in charge of the outside of the building. So anytime that we have uh, a situation where we, we, we need to get the building boarded up 
um, the UWF Historic Trust, they're the ones that handle the outside of the building, but we're the ones that have to handle everything on the inside. And so that goes back to Tristan's point when he talked about it's really important to have an emergency uh, team in place and also to make sure you have all your contacts. And so for our purposes, what we have, because we're part of the uh, University of West Florida, UWF has a program called uh, Building Emergency Management Program. And so basically, it's a little training that they have different um, facilities. Uh, UWF has over 100 buildings on their main campus, as well as downtown, that they're responsible for. So they have a program where people who are in those different facilities can go through it and be, become designated as what they call building uh, emergency man, uh, responders, emergency, building emergency responders. And so um, for us, that's really four of our staff. So it's myself. Uh, Bill Lees, who's our executive director, our associate director, Della Scott Ireton, and then our office administrator, uh, whose, whose name is Mary. And so we're the building emergency management coordinators. And what that means is anytime that there's an, an emergency situa situation like a hurricane, we are the, the liaison or point of contact between for our building for with the university's uh, office of emergency management, UWF uh, police department, as well as the UWF Historic Trust, since they're the ones that are, they own the, the building and are responsible for maintaining it, as well as the city of Pensacola, because our building um, is, is located right next to the city park that has a lot of trees, really tall trees. So, you know, in the situation where a hurricane came through and a tree fell down on our building or in the parking lot, we'd have to have contacts with the city to kind of figure that out. And so that's the role we play for the emergency uh, building uh, Response or responders after the fact, uh, but we do have a plan in place. So if if we know a hurricane is coming, um, of course it's gonna it's gonna depend on the severity of the hurricane, in terms of uh, the types of preparations that we put into place. So if it's just uh, you know a tropical depression, um, uh, you know you don't necessarily have to move the entire collections out of the building. Whereas if you have a, a much more uh, severe hurricane like a Category Two and up that's when we have to put a lot of different parameters in place uh, to try to mitigate as much as we can in terms of trying to save that collection. Another thing that's a little bit unique about our facility is that um, almost all the artifacts that we have on display are all on loan. They're all on uh, long-term loans, mainly with the um, Florida Division of Historical Resources. Uh, and so we, we don't actually own those. So, so that's another point of contact that we have to incorporate into our emergency plan in terms of who we communicate with uh, when we're moving artifacts. So it's not only those ones that are already listed, but it's also uh, the Division of Historical Resources. Um, we do have a state collections facility on our main campus um, through our uh, Archaeology Institute. So that's another layer uh, that we have to communicate with when everything, when, whenever we have to start putting plans into action. But what, but what does that actually look like? So Tristan mentioned already a lot of good equipment and supplies to have, to have at hand. Um, and we do have a, a lot of the basic stuff. Um, while we don't have things like wet vacs uh, and, and large fans in our facility, those are things that we do know that we can get from uh, building maintenance with the University of West Florida or with the UWF Store Trust. So uh, you don't necessarily have to have that on hand, but it's good to know like where you can get it when you actually need it. Um, so, so, so back to his point where, you know, it's not something that you necessarily have to have on hand, uh, some of the larger equipment items, but just definitely try to have a plan to where you can get that if you need it. But some of the basic stuff that's pretty inexpensive that, that we will Put into place regardless of whether it's like a you know tropical depression or a category three hurricane is things like plastic sheets and so the first thing that that we want to do is we make sure that any of our uh, equipment electronic equipment any of our, of our file cabinets with um, paper files in them that those are all covered by these large sheets of plastic um, so you you know that's really critical and these sheets of plastic are, are relatively inexpensive and um, they're e pretty easy to store. They don't really take up a lot of space if you fold them correctly and keep them in a, in a box or a, uh, a disaster uh, bin like Tristan had mentioned. They really don't take up a lot of space and they're incredibly effective. And so um, for those types of equipment, 
upstairs. Uh, we're really not worried so much about water from a storm surge, but of course, you know, if the roof gets blown off, then water can leak into that way. That's obviously something you need to be concerned about. Um, another thing that we do is, uh, in terms of our lab, a lot of times we'll have different collections that have been excavated um, around Pensacola that will be in our in our care in the uh, in our public archaeology lab. And so, if it's just a you know a tropical depression, what we'll do is we'll box up those artifacts. We'll take them upstairs to our highest level. Uh, and what we have a uh, in our classroom, we have a, a closet. We will stack all the boxes in there and then cover those with plastic. So again, we want to make sure you're getting these things really high up off the ground. Uh, but if even but if even if they are up high off the ground, you need to make sure you cover them with some type of protect uh, protection in case you do get water leakage inside the building. Um, in terms of the artifacts that we have in our museum, um, all of our artifacts are secured under uh, just plexiglass bonnets. And so one thing I would recommend is if you have, uh, you know, if you have a lot of different display cases that are secured with screws, it's really, really handy to have a uh, battery powered drill um, because that would just save you a lot of time. Um, it, you know, we, it would take us four or five times as much time to undo cases with a handheld screwdriver than it would with just a battery operated drill. And so um, if it's just a tropical depression, uh, we don't usually have to worry about moving those out of the display cases because they already are a good, you know, five, six feet off the ground, most of them. Uh, but if it was a more severe category storm, then we would have to then remove those bonnets, uh, get all the artifacts out of the display cases, and we would either um, put those upstairs with our collections that we had removed from our lab, or if it was a really bad uh, storm that we knew was coming and we had enough time, we would actually take those collections, all of them, and we would take them to our main campus that's much, much higher ground to our collections facility there. But again, a lot of that's going to have to do with how much time, uh, how much preparation, uh, how much staff you have that might be available to do that. Um, so that's, again, it's something to kind of consider when you're making these plans. Um, and then, of course, who, who is available. Um, so in terms of the outside of our building, that's when we really have to do a lot of coordinating. And that's why it's good to have those liaisons or point of contacts into place. And so for our outside of the building, because it's owned by UWF Historic Trust, they're actually responsible for securing the windows. So they're the ones that, that have all the equipment and supplies to board up the windows because we have quite a few windows since it's a historic building around our facility. Also things like uh, sandbags for the doors. Uh, we have uh, three different, actually we have four, four doors on our facility. So you need to make sure you have some of those available or at least um, know where to get them. And that is where we would contact the maintenance with the University of West Florida or through our UWF Historic Trust uh, with, with their maintenance uh, facility there as well. Um, so those are just kind of some of the basic things you can do with relatively inexpensive equipment. But as, as Tristan stated, it's really important to make sure that you have uh, a team in place, uh, make sure that you have um, current information. Uh, he mentioned taking photographs, that's really important especially if you're moving artifacts, um, you know, boxing them up and then taking them to a different location. Uh, before we would move anything, we would take pictures of everything in display cases, especially since uh, most of what we have are all alone. So, uh, so that's another layer that we have to consider. Uh, and that requires a lot more paperwork as well when we're relocating things. So um, a lot of what Tristan mentioned having as part of the uh, emergency plan we have, so those kind of basic equipment items that I mentioned, uh, but also just contact information in terms of uh, telephone numbers. Um, email addresses are nice to have too, but you might be out with out power for a little while too. So it's important to both have email contact as well as phone numbers and to make sure that you know exactly who to call. So um, with our UWF Historic Trust Partners, I know that my point of contact with them is their historic preservation officer, who is, who is uh, Ross. So he's my main point of contact. But then you also need to know um, for other organizations or other entities that you have to deal with uh, who you should actually contact within the uh, city of Pensacola, for example. I need, to know, I, I need to know the contact number of their parks and recreation since they're the ones that are in charge of that park that's right next to us. Um, and as Tristan said, uh, there's a lot of resources out there. He put out some really great ones. I think the only ones that I might add to some of those 
um, would be the uh, Florida Association of Museums. That's a great organization that, that you can become a member of, um, and their membership is, is pretty reasonably priced. The American Alliance of Museums also has some great resources uh, that you don't necessarily have to be a member to access, but if you have a membership with them, it, it opens up a lot more resources. And then the National Park Service, they have tons of resources online for situations like this. Um, a lot of their resources are, uh, that I think are super helpful, uh, especially for you know, after emergency, you know, say you had a bunch of books or documents that got wet, you know, what do you do? They have a great series called Conservagrams. Uh, and those are, great, those are great resources that you can access online right now as PDF files. Um, but as you're, you know, if you already have an emergency plan in place, that's great. Uh, but what you can do is I would say try to print some of those uh, hard copies out. So that way, you know, if the disaster hits, you're very unlikely to be able to access um, some of those documents if you have them on a computer somewhere uh, or if, you know, your power's out. So it's nice to have a hard copy of that stuff because it's so much information to remember, especially when you're dealing with um, trying to address issues of uh, contamination of, of artifacts or when paper gets wet, you know, what do you do? So those are good resources to have in place. And also FEMA has some really good resources too. Um, but all the ones that Tristan mentioned are really excellent um, things to keep uh, as part of your uh, library or at least to keep in areas that you can access for when you will need them. And with that, I think we can open it up to, to questions. I'd be happy to answer any questions. And of course, uh, 